We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. not understand that they are that way because you're Joe Flacco. And you just like to discredit things that people deserve credit for. That you can't possibly be expected to defend that. Talk about the game, Sam. So Who cares about what people think about us? Yeah, I like football, I like football season and all the things that go with it. Welcome into the PFF NFL podcast. Steve Palazzolo joined by former co-host of the PFF NFL yeah. podcast back in the day. Mike Renner making his return. How you doing, buddy? Doing great. That was, gosh, what was it, three years, two years ago? Three years ago? It was a, it's been a minute now. And yeah. I still got the Sam Monson face behind me, which I'm not too thrilled about, but. Oh, how did we not? Yeah. Oh, we do have, so. we do have a, uh, my dreams a headshot there. of you. That we can, uh, if we could stitch that in that at some point. That is also very dated. <laughs> yeah, that's also dated. You've uh, you've rebranded your your current look, and you guys are rebranding the Two for One Drafts podcast, yeah. right? How about that? I, evolving. I, I like to call it evolving. Evolving. Huh? It's evolving too. How are you guys evolving the Two for One Drafts podcast? Aren't you rebranding in a couple weeks? Yeah. Well, I can't. Not going to drop the name just yet. Okay. But it's going to rebrand in the middle of July. We're going to revamp to not be not so weary. It's called two for one drafts, and no one knows why it's called two for one drafts. Truthfully, it was going to be dumb called name from the beginning. It's going to be called weekend stories or something. <laughs> yeah, basically, but it's not to pigeonhole us into just it was a rookies and drafts podcast, which is a niche. You just like stories happen during the season that you would like to talk about. That you're just like, no, we're a rookies and drafts podcast. We're not going to talk about that. Right. And so now we're going to touch on more than just rookies and drafts. It's going to be the scope of it. So. All right, well, that makes sense. So if people go and subscribe right now to Two for One Drafts, yes. it'll be the same feed. It'll just be, uh, I can't wait to see. The, the, it's going to be like corporate Mike showing up and everything. All our suits every podcast. Yes. I can't wait. That's going to be part of the rebrand, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I have to show up on time, too, apparently. Yeah, you got to okay, be on time. Got to be decked out. No more, uh, no more joggers as business cash, as mm. we say, right? Yeah, sadly. So go check that out, Two for One Drafts podcast. But we got Mike on the show here. I just wanted to talk general... What did I title this? Secrets of the PFF player evaluation system. Yeah. That should draw people in. But we'll talk about how, how we uh, have evaluated draft prospects through the years, how you like to do it, because you are the person behind our, our draft boards mm -hmm. and, and all the draft analysis and everything. So we'll talk a little bit about that, yeah? Yeah, the, the, also the evolution. It evolved the, yeah. the key word on the show, the evolution from just looking back. And I, and I did a lot of, I've done a lot of looking back at past yeah. draft evals that we said. Uh, over the past uh, month and a half or so, whatever, since the drafts ended, and kind of just how we approached it back then and what we looked for and how we kind of came to our big boards yeah. and then how we approach it now and how we're trying to approach it in the future. And where we're going. All right, well, we can get into that, and uh, we'll do a little preview of the 2022 draft. Very light. Yes. Light preview just to figure out where the strengths and weaknesses are. But let's get into the, let's get into the player evaluation system right now because mm – -hmm. Uh, if you have premium stats for the NFL, you know that goes all the way back to 2006. If you have it for college, which by the way, it's a separate subscription, but if you have it for college, it goes back to 2014, the first year that we graded every player mm -hmm. on every player on every play in college football. Um, what have you found over the last month and a half about how we have taken the grades and, and tried to put them into, say, draft boards and projecting players? Yeah, I mean, I've gone back to the the focus draft, the first one we did, the, the focus mock, way back in 2015 that was. That almost doesn't even count. <laughs> Some of them do. Some that, of the yeah. picks count. So, Troy Hill counts. So for <laughs> context on that, I think that dra that mock draft, or the, we finished grading that first season, so it was 2014 season. We finished grading, what, like a month before the draft? Yeah. We That's finished our, grading all the college games. By the way, famous, famous PFF story here. Mm -hmm. This was 
Chris bought the company just before the 2014 season. We had about 10 people who graded every single game in the NFL that got us through the NFL. Neil assured Chris that we would also do the college football season that year. And Chris looks at him and says, okay, how many more guys do we have to hire? And Neil just looks at him and says, zero. That means all of us took our normal workload, added 868 games or whatever it is to it, and we finished grading every single college game the night of the Super Bowl, which was like our soft deadline. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Sorry, just to – I thought the story was great because we all like crammed the month of January <laughs> to make sure that we got those games done. So, yeah, the 2014 season was drafted for the 15 draft Yeah, a couple months in advance. And, and so that one we had – you know, we had famously, I will say, famously Tr Trey Flowers as a first rounder, famously Tr Grady Jarrett as a first rounder in those years, went fourth and fifth and round. And then not so famously. Not so famously. I mean, Troy Hill, actually, we Gary had as a Peters. first rounder. Gary Peters, we, had, we ended up he, in the second the second round. round. Okay. But Gary Peters, we had Jalen Strong in the top 15 that year. Yeah. Some, some L's as well. But we, I think the biggest thing we came at it in the beginning was production. Like it was... How productive were we at a college football field? And that was the guys who were most productive. The Shane Ray at eighth. The, he had the highest pass rushing grade in the country that year. Yeah. We we're like, okay, highest pass rushing grade, your top 10 pick. When it's like, there are every guy, I think the biggest thing I've learned is that every single guy outside of a few outliers has to improve once they get to the NFL. They, they have to get better in some way, shape, or form. And so the guys that can improve the guys that have the physical tools to make their life easier in some aspect are the ones that can, I guess, like then improve more. I guess, I'm not I sure exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I get what there, you're saying. Like, so you, other than say the Boses, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, so we're, like, the Boses, I mean, Sam, who's, by the way, Sam, Sam will be back mm -hmm. next week if you guys miss him. Um, Sam famously mentions like the knock on Joey Bosa was people thought he was maxed out. It's like, okay, fine. But maxed out Joey Bosa is it's a top 10 NFL, yeah. edge already. Right. So, um, those guys still seem to be, um, outliers, the Bosa's and Garrett yeah. and Chase Young, right? They're at the high end. Uh, but you're saying is people have what to, can improve. Yes. yes. So what can improve, but also just what are you doing at the college level that will translate, right? Yes. And because grades, grades are constructed, grades are production based, mm -hmm. but there are so many different schemes and things that people are asked to do. And then yeah. athleticism matters certainly at other positions. Yeah, right? I think what can improve and then roll. So like Scooby Wright, famously, we were, we called him like a second rounder. And it's like his role was playing spot drop zone in Arizona's defense or blitzing. Right. That doesn't exist in the NFL. You can't just back off into off cover three and sit and make tackles in front of you all day long against tight ends. That's not going to happen. Right. Like you're, you're guarding wide receivers if you're a linebacker in today's NFL. And so you better move like a cornerback if you're going you know, to go in the first round, you're going to go in the second round. You're going to be that guy that's coveted. So I think those are the biggest things that have evolved our process. And rec like I said, recognizing the role and then recognizing what can improve. And so just because a guy grades well, doesn't this, if he did it in a role that's going to be nothing like what he's going to be asked to do in the NFL, and you kind of throw that grade out the window then and see, try to isolate the areas where he is going to be asked to do what he's going to do in the NFL and then evaluate those. So linebackers were definitely some of our early misses. Yeah. Um, Scooby Wright, Paul Dawson, those were guys who were bad yeah, athletes. Paul Dawson, if there you've was, heard the stories around Cincinnati, and it wasn't just – There was some off-field as yeah. well. <laughs> right. There it was, was some, not just the fact that he ran a 4-9. But so, but but even if he was to play, yeah, it probably would have been a challenge at at his athletic level. You, then you yes. you do have guys like T.J. Edwards with the Eagles. You don't want to go to like just specific one offs here and there. But either mm -hmm. way, we early on our biggest misses, I would say, unathletic linebackers who were productive struggled, and then there was a guy like Deion Jones who did not grade well in mm -hmm. college and was extremely athletic. Um, I've got a theory that linebacker. And I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this. The okay. linebacker is becoming the most challenging position on defense. I know corner is always, you know, you're one-on-one, -on -one, you're on an island. But linebacker, everything offenses are doing is to try to put, yeah. is to just make linebackers wrong. And you must see this a ton at the college level. Yeah, I, I think I said on one of the pods we just did that SEC linebackers this past year were under siege. They, they were under attack. Like yeah. every, every single offense in the SEC, Florida, Alabama, their playbook was intended on 
like you said, making them wrong. Yeah. Like they have no right answer. And so you're going to get, you know, downgrades on their grading profile, like their coverage downgrades where it's like, I don't know, unless you're Ruben Foster, you know, you're not making these plays, right. <laughs> you know, unless you really are seeing the game at Luke Keekley's level, you're just, you're not making these plays because you have three different things going on that you're seeing at once that you have to account for all of them. And I think a lot of that falls on DCs then at that point. I and mean, that's why I don't think a lot of linebackers get, a lot of people see linebackers as replaceable uh, in the NFL or a lot of teams don't invest in them because it's a very scheme dependent position also. Even um, I try to explain our grades as well at the NFL level, you know, because we, Devin White's a guy who comes up a lot and makes a lot of splash plays, but a lot yeah. of them are as a blitzer and, you know, he flies around the field. He makes mm -hmm. a lot of positives. But I think also the casual fan doesn't realize the 20 yard dig route, you know, over the middle of the field yeah. is often in part because of the linebacker, right? Mm -hmm. Is because he's not getting depth and all these things. I just think everything that they're asked to do get depth in zone, work downhill, cover a tight end man-to-man, -man, cover a back man-to-man, -man, tackle Lamar Jackson in the open field, take yeah. on a pulling guard. All the things <laughs> they have to do, that's like 15 skill sets rolled into one Yeah, at linebacker. It, it really, I think that is the biggest thing. It's You can be exceptional in one aspect and very deficient in another aspect because, like you said, being able to recognize play action and drop under a crosser is not the same as being able to track down a running back in the flat. They're not even like close to the same thing. One, you're going backwards, one, you're going forwards, one's like uh, how fast you're reading the play, one is just purely reacting. So uh, that is the tough thing about linebackers that, like I said, it's gonna be, it's gonna be role dependent. It's gonna be what you're asked to do. Um, it's gonna kind of dictate how you then produce. How, how much do you take uh, the senior bowl into account then with, at those positions where you do get to see a guy? I mean, you might see more reps in three senior bowl practices that are mm -hmm. NFL-ish, right, than what you see in 500 snaps, 800 snaps maybe in college, right? So how, how have you taken the senior bowl? I, I love the senior bowl for line of scrimmage. Yeah. Uh, One-on-ones on the corners and wide receivers and that sort of stuff is, is good. I, I do think the big ends of the spectrum, like if a guy does not lose – or vice versa if a guy doesn't win um obviously that's a big red flag but i do think for the line of scrimmage because a lot of times you just you don't see that uh be because it's such a physically demanding position there are so few guys who are six four two six so, so defensive end six four two sixty that run a four six there's so few guys that an, even a pac 12 offensive tackle may not see one all year one guy that could sniff the nfl in that regard and so at that point, if you're not facing one single guy, it's like, you, it's not close. It's not, it's not near the same thing blocking a guy who's, who's just not athletically or maybe size-wise at an NFL level. It's just a completely different animal. So I do think it's big for those evals, even though it, it is not a lot of reps. And that's one thing I told. Everything's a small sample size. Yeah, that's right? one yeah. thing I told uh, Eric Galco is the new Shrine Bowl. I'm like, just get more of these one-on-one -on -one reps. Let's see more of them. I, I don't care about uh you know these run blocking drills that you're doing to like like you're really going to coach a guy over the course of a week it's like let's see them actually let's get them better for eval evaluation what they can actually do because they're not going to change who they are over the course of three practices that was uh, i think it was mike martz famously remember andre woodson the uh qb out of kentucky yeah years yeah. ago i think mike martz was the senior ball uh code offensive coach or whatever and he was trying to he was like oh no i like my quarterbacks to take their dropbacks like this and he's probably doing <laughs> he's the old school like he change. was changing their mechanics and everything it's like man I, this is a showcase i'm just trying to zip it around here yeah like change their mechanics they're gonna it's not gonna be it's gonna be a bad eval then like it's gonna right. be worse for the eval and try to get them to do something they've never done before you want the, you want the guys to look good not necessarily fit them into your yeah. system for uh for three days um so that uh, what else I, I do want to get into like how the college game has evolved because mm -hmm. I think as since we started you're you're seeing defense so offenses started running more RPOs and it's like man there goes our offensive line evaluation we don't get to see them in pass protection now defenses are adjusting mm -hmm. and it's like a completely different game it's just big dudes three-man lines you don't have two edge rushers so now it's affecting the defensive side of the ball it's just Making it more difficult to evaluate players, man. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing there that we've improved upon, I, I touched on, you know, Jalen Strong, we had in the top 15. We had Corey Coleman, Josh Doxson as top 10 players when they were coming out. So wide receivers recognizing 
what production kind of matters or, yeah. or where where to look and what's going to translate to the NFL to kind of limit your your busts your you know to really identify the guys who will still succeed the, you know the Michael Thomases of the world uh, the AJ Browns uh, the guys DK Metcalf we had them one and two that year to recognize that yeah it, DK Metcalf was not productive in college by any sort of total production metric by even PFF grades because of the role he was in, but where he won and the way he won is where you want to win at the NFL. You know, he was able to win on the vertical route tree consistently, even if it didn't end up to a lot of yards because his quarterback's pretty tough situation. He was just running the vertical tree there at Ole Miss. So I do think that that's, you know, winning at the line of scrimmage and beating man coverage and one-on-one coverage is so far more important than just racking up empty yards. I, one of the other things I think I there, there, there was one year I think we had seven or eight interior defensive linemen as say first or second round picks and a lot of it there was a lot of good college run defenders coming out that year and even the way the draft unfolded it this was like Austin Johnson from yeah. Penn State and uh, this is I think it was Ashawn Robinson and Jaron Reed in the same draft it was all these guys um, I, I've seen other people say this too and I think a, a challenging thing is just because you can see it and recognize it doesn't mean it's valuable uh, to me that's one of the most difficult things to understand as an evaluator so like it's easy to see a guy win all the time in the run game and and say i see that i can evaluate it and i know this guy's good check that box and i think that makes you want to rank a guy higher right yeah and that's different you know and so it's being able to sort through the stuff that you know you can quantify versus the stuff you know is valuable you know to your and, point and i think that's even even like NFL play callers, I still think that's a lot of the big bias towards running backs and maybe box safeties drafting like a Jonathan Abram in the yeah. first round where it's like, oh, he's going to make a lot more plays. Well, it's like that play, difference between a Jonathan Abram making XYZ play and some other safety who maybe is not going to be as good as Jonathan Abram in the run game is three yards, two or three yards. The difference between the plays and coverage that Jonathan Abram makes or busts and the difference between the playing covers that, you know, a better coverage safety makes is 25 yards, 30 yards. They're Good the point. big plays that end up, you know, was, who is it? Uh, or Meyer talking about explosive plays. That's what they're trying to generate. That's how teams score in the NFL nowadays. That's the difference between, like I said, a box safety and a better coverage safety. So uh, any other, wh where else did you go when you're looking back? Any other big takeaways? Were there specific takeaways? Were there certain positions? Because I, I, I know what I know what our grades are strong at as mm -hmm. far as you know positionally, and you could find you know the stable numbers and unstable numbers, and we do that. I think the biggest thing then, the, kind of the last thing I mentioned, wide receivers, and I, I think we've done a lot better on wide receivers. Like even compared to like the NFL, I feel like we've been pretty good at wide receivers and evolving how we evaluate that but it's still the position where it's still kind of just i'm not sure anyone's quarterback and it's the most valuable one and you get all this accuracy data you get all these this throw charting and we have an incredible amount more than anyone's ever had at the position and it's still so dependent on it's just so dependent on all so many other factors that it is difficult to really nail down that position and no one's nailed it down so from a PFF standpoint, guys who did not crush it from a grade standpoint, mm -hmm. Patrick Mahomes, Dak Prescott, uh, Justin Herbert, even though there were he was on his way, I, but he I, didn't I would dominate. Say he's, I would say he was fine, though. He had a 90-plus grade at one point. He not, did. I yeah. mean, he, he did, but he didn't really progress. I mean, his yeah. career on paper looked a little bit like Josh Rosen. Without, like, he had a higher peak than Josh Rosen, but it never really got better. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel like Herbert's was more... I always just kept coming back to Herbert's like mental side of the game was so odd. Like he had so many yeah. odd decisions on his tape, like right. sliding short on third down, the uh, throw you know, out take, of the back of the end yeah, zone, throwing a, throwing a hail mary out of the, the back game. of the end zone, taking a massive shot, diving for the end zone when they were down like twenty four points with a minute <laughs> left, and it's like just these plays where it's just that is not. It, it just that's what that that's why I was low on Herbert. It wasn't necessarily the arm talent and ability to play quarterback, it was kind of the mental aspect of the game was so off in a lot of different games. So how do you think quarterback evaluation so. is evolving? And because Josh Allen has 
has essentially bucks the trend. My famous line I say on here all the time is players don't just get better like it's <laughs> like it's a Madden game, right? They, you don't just add four points to their overall every year. Yeah. You know, guys go up, they go down. And almost every quarterback in the NFL is more dependent on their supporting cast, I think maybe more than ever. I, I think there's fewer guys at the top end of the quarterback spectrum that are just, mm. you know, supporting cast agnostic, so to speak, where they can always carry their team. So that's the truth. And then you have a guy like Allen who's taken the arm talent and feel, you know, has the position evolved essentially that you have to make the plays outside the pocket. They're, they're, like, should we have been higher on a Mac Jones who was really productive or are we gun shy on that because of the outside the pocket stuff? I think, I'm not, I don't think it's the outside the pocket stuff. I think it's the way NFL offenses have evolved. And you just look at the game now compared to five years ago, the ability to create open throws for quarterbacks Far, far more offenses have that. You know, far more offenses are creating more open guys, more so than ever before in NFL history. And a lot of that helps when an open throw is 45 yards down the football field. If you have an arm that can put it there like that, the windows are a lot bigger down the football field when you do have that arm strength. When you don't have that arm strength, the windows, they like they hold, the holes and those sort of stuff collapse. So it's the guys that can really open up that level of the playbook and then open up the running aspect of the playbook where – nothing kind of brings the defense to its knees and limits what you can do than a running quarterback. They're not running quarterback, mobile quarterback, a guy who can threaten you with the option game with, like I said, the outside the pocket stuff, because that it's just another way to create. And so I think these offensive coordinators, the minds proliferating around the NFL are creating more and building their offenses for the quarterbacks instead of plugging a quarterback into their offense. So I, I agree, man. I, so there's uh, – the interesting trend to me is the two of the better play callers in the NFL, Sean McVay and Kyle Shanahan, mm -hmm. having good quarterbacks that just, you know, execute their offense. Having a Jared Goff, having a Jimmy Garoppolo. Guys where bo – they both signed big contracts, which was the standard in the NFL for years. If you found a starting quarterback that wasn't trash, yeah. you signed him to a contract, right? Yeah. And, the, and they both did that. And then they got to a point where they were like, actually, I want more. I need more than that. I need to have somebody who's going to work beyond the system. So I thought, I, I don't know if this is going to be the next common trend, which is essentially we're not satisfied with a starter. Because if you're just ranking quarterbacks, you could within the last few years, you could easily make a case that Goff or Garoppolo at any given point was in the top 15, top 12, wherever you want to put them. And both teams just said, actually, I got, I, I'm going from Goff to Stafford. And the Niners, I'm going from Garoppolo to Trey Lance. And so does that end up becoming the trend where like a starter just isn't good enough because teams have to, they want that top 10 guy or just that ability to keep defenses off balance? I think so. And I think we're going to see it with the Baker Mayfield and Lamar Jackson extensions, I think. And could be wrong, but I don't think they're going to just give those guys the extensions right away. I, don't, I think they're going to learn from the golf, the Wentz, and be like, hey, you know, these kind of – inconsistent passers guys who have been up and down in that regard until they really show it until they really show they can create those explosive plays with their arm consistently it's going to hold off because it's that that can screw you way faster giving him that big deal than kind of what happened with Dak Prescott where they waited it out waited it out waited it out yeah you finally give him the big deal but now you still got Dak and you still got a good roster run I look at Dak and I, th I at the time I was I was wary too as far as locking him up because of everything that we're saying. Mm -hmm. You know, is Dak really – can you really separate him from 10 or 12 other quarterbacks around the league? There was a point where you couldn't. I'm, I'm a little bit more sold on him, I think, over just the last year plus of watching him, but at the same time, and nice group. Uh, and honestly, as bad as it sounds to say, I think the ankle injury and then the comparison between him and Ian Dalton, the same offense, helped him. Oh, it absolutely helped him. That I was... thought – I was wrong on that. I thought it was going to hurt him because – for, now, first off, the offensive line completely fell apart. They ranked 27th in our rankings, and they all they were all, tackles. No one's gonna, yeah, yeah. They were they were a disaster. But if if the Cowboys' O line was healthy, and Dalton was under center, and you have that trio of receivers, I think that's a productive offense. And Dalton did show flashes, but then he was really bad with the playoffs on the line and all that. I, I'm with you. I do think it helped that plus Dak throwing you know 450 yards per game on the way in. True. I've heard you mention before when you talk when you talk about arm strength, uh, the deep crossing route. Is that like so? When you're evaluating arm strength, do you have certain throws you're looking at? What do you 
Because I've heard you say, hey, if a guy can't make the deep crosser in today's NFL, there's like a certain zip to it, right? I like to look at the guys like 50 plus yard throws. Just, you do? They just go to immediately the farthest throws they've made. I, I've, that was like the first thing I watched in this quarterback class. Maybe you've like devolved. The ones that they really can pump. And just to see, and, and then you watch, I like to watch like put all the guys on tape back to back to back together, just kind of see what that looks like for all of them. Yeah. And, and obviously in this year's class, the difference between Lawrence, um, I, I think Lance had quite easily, not easily, but like when watching all those, Lance is the one who's came out like that one has cooked just a little bit hotter than the rest, even though they all have big arms. And then besides Jones then, who was like, those were him putting it all, those were, you know, rainbows. And it was 50 yeah. plus yards. He had to give it a, you know, a Russell Wilson-esque deep ball, but Russell Wilson has a cannon and throws it just, uh, that's a stylistically how he throws his deep ball. But, um, but I do like to watch the, longest throws and after that outside the number stuff is where because can you yeah you could throw hard but when you throw hard is it still accurate right and that's the biggest thing with i worry about with mac jones is that when he is throwing deep and you watch his tape in alabama and yeah he had a lot of deep completions but his sort of distance control it's like he has to he has to play a three iron when all these other guys are playing seven irons for forty yard throws Ooh, that's a good comparison and so it's like it's like the bryson DeChambeau yeah. of golf uh, he, he's hitting wedges in when everyone else is hitting. And when you can hit a wedge, that 40-yard throw is a lot easier. I, I, I make fun of the, um, the scouts that say they had to be there and watch a guy <laughs> in person and all. You feel like you're evolving into the got to be there to no. see the arm strength God, no. guy. But I will say, I was at, um, when we did the little training camp tour a couple years ago, it was uh, Geno Smith and Ryan Fitzpatrick were in Jets camp running the same offense. And Fitz was what you're describing Mac Jones to be. I mean, it was like a crow hop to – to get the ball down the field, but he also just ran the offense so much faster and more efficiently, mm -hmm. whereas Gino was just a touch late on everything, and then the, just the spiral was beautiful. But it is, it's one of those things that you can look at and quantify, but it might not matter. I mean, the same year I watched, Sam Bradford was in camp before he got traded with uh, the Eagles and Carson Wentz, and I thought Sam, I love Sam Bradford. I thought Bradford had the most beautiful, tight spiral I've ever seen. And Wentz has a cannon for an arm. Mm -hmm. And the ball came out of Bradford's arm even better. I mean, it just came off his hand even better. So it's one of those things that, like, it's nice to see, it's nice and all that stuff, but it, like, you just can't overrate that stuff. What was that one, the week one game that Bradford just dialed it up? Was that when he was with Minnesota, right after he got traded? So there was, And then yeah. he, just, he just lit the world on fire, and he had that one, like, crossing route that went right over a defender's shoulder. While like, he was shoulder. getting smoked. Yeah. Yes. And that was one of the prettiest throws. Ever. They had the yeah. the angle right behind him, and it just looks gorgeous. It's, it's like, on my Twitter somewhere. It looks like someone, hit, you know, throwing a dart from, like, mile away into a dartboard it was beautiful but yeah he had two absolutely incredible games with the vikings it, it was the first week of 2016 i believe uh, against the saints oh no 17 was against the saints and there was a game against the packers i think see we need in eric to come back on he would he eric would, would know would, every <laughs> single one i know <laughs> he would put it put us to shame i used to have good recall he would have the whole game right back recalled for us i used to have good recall and then eric shows up and he's got better recall it knows everything but i will say the rams are coming around to our method you, you see you saw about how they're not sending their scouts to the senior bowl anymore they're yeah. not they're trying to keep them home as much as possible to watch as much tape as possible to focus on that part of it and use gps data and that sort of stuff to evaluate the physical aspects and, and not overrate how the guy looks in shorts how that the guy, is how the ball comes off his hand and, and actually rely on hard fast things that you can kind of measure and how a guy actually plays the game of football instead of how he might look in a practice setting. That is the next step. Um, Daniel Jeremiah mentioned it, you know, teams having tracking data. Mm -hmm. And I can't reveal what we're doing yet, but we'll be there um, as far as having the tracking data. And that will be a game changer. You know, it, it, instead of a, you know, a snowy morning in February at the Combine determining how fast you are, yeah. it'll be all 400 routes that you ran in college, you know, and we'll have speed and change of direction and all that stuff and it, it already exists in in some circles but i think nfl teams don't have it all yet uh that will change things um and then being able to compare that directly to the nfl mm -hmm. and saying this is what an nfl receiver does this is what an nfl cornerback does and and being able to make those comparisons and figuring out again where that stuff actually matters people have already done some good work even on just past tra trajectory and velocity and stuff like that right because there's certainly more than just pure velocity yeah i think 
anytime you can take away the subjectiveness of, ooh, that was that looked fast. Yeah. Well, it's like a guy looks fast, and it happens a lot at small schools, you know, F their group of five stuff, where it's like, oh, that uh, that corner looks fast. Well, is the, it's because the wide receiver is going up against runs four seven. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, you look at that makeup speed. Well, it's because the guy he was running against uh, isn't going to sniff the league and just came off, you know, the street. So I thought Rashard Higgins in college looked really fast. I mean, that dude had. He averaged like 25 yards on screen passes. Yeah. You take him to the house and he ran like a 4.68 or whatever at the combine. He's been a good NFL receiver, but he, I thought he was a good athlete mm-hmm. in college at Colorado State. Uh, what about guys That's who show up in the NFL and just look small? Like I thought Tua just looked small last year. And I thought the arm looked small. I just, I, I, that's one thing I can't stand either. This <laughs> is, <when, laughs> is when a guy just what looks <laughs> different. When you, when you yeah. see him in NFL. No, I, that was – actually, that was Burrow with me. I was like – Really? I always thought arm was not strong, but then he comes in year one, and I was like, oof, that's about, that's about like bottom of the barrel in the NFL. It's about as weak as it gets. Now, they've been talking about a zip. Uh, you know, they've been talking about him lifting, and yeah. T. Higgins has said it's got a little more. So his hands were hurting, but um, he needed it because he was, like I said, about as weak as it gets in the NFL. Well, I've always been of the mind – I'm as a former thrower, Mike, you mm-hmm. can – it's not like you add five to 10 miles an hour in your 20s. But it, I honestly think it depends on what your training has been previously. And if you haven't trained up yeah. to, your, to when you're 22 or 23, and you do train properly, there's a reason why people in Major League Baseball are all throwing high 90s. Like everybody in the bullpen's high 90s into 100. The training programs are that much better. So I will say you can improve velocity, but it depends on what your starting point is if it's, if it's bad. I mean, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, of course. He came into the NFL yeah. was not no one was raving about Aaron Rodgers as a god tier arm. Yeah. Like no one was raving about that. And then NFL weight rooms, obviously he was very young when he was drafted. What is he just turned twenty one, maybe not even changed his throwing motion and a then little bit and everything. All of a sudden he's got, you know, about as strong an arm as we see in the past decade. Yeah. And, and even if, if you watch Brady's rookie season in 2011, like he was floating the ball and there was a reason why he went in the sixth round. He didn't have a cannon in college. But his short and intermediate velocity is has always been as good as it gets. I've said that with I think Zach Wilson, we could see a bump in even him, and he even has a hose right now. But he's very underdeveloped physically and young. Yeah, and just the way he throws his all arm, if he just gets a little like lower body strength to him, I think he can add some velocity. Also, that was a big part of Rogers too. He's just got such great torque in his lower body. So there's mechanical yeah. things as well. To before we get into the 2022 draft. Don't forget, PFF has partnered with Symbol, that's S-I-M-B-U-L-L. More ways to gamble here, Mike. Stock mar- the stock market for sports that allows you to trade sports teams like stocks and earn cash payouts when your teams win. Symbol has blended sports and the stock market to offer you a new way to invest and profit off your favorite teams. You can bet on your Brewers, because MLB is in full swing. Rest of the summer, you can do all that. Daily cash payouts. NFL is still having moves, big moves. Julio Jones going to the Titans, so you can still bet on... NFL teams here in the middle of the summer. So whoever lands the next Julio, be sure to get in there early. Use the promo code PFF. Deposit $10 at symbol.app slash PFF to earn a free PFF annual subscription. It's promo code PFF with a $10 deposit at symbol.app slash PFF to earn a free annual subscription. Have you seen Ohio is closing in on maybe legalizing sports betting by the fall? Really? Will you bet if they do in here if they do? Would you? I could dabble here and there. We're just. Uh, I definitely would. I don't now. Or I, yeah. I will. I know people that go over to Indiana just to hop at a gas station and then place bets. Really? And then come back. That's not you. Not now. me. Not but the it, convenience but, factor would. But it made it. If it was convenient. Yeah. My brother live bets golf because he lives in Chicago, and I'm like, you have to have better things to do than live betting golf. That's. Oh man. But he's like, it gives you a it gives you a little vested interest in each hole. Like, I've never been that into it, uh, to gambling in general, but. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it'll be good for our business. I'll say that. the more, the more people that are interested in wrong. numbers that will help them make money. Yeah. Let's just say that. Wrong. Uh, let's touch on Aaron Rodgers really quickly. Okay. Because you talked about it. What, what's your prediction? What, what happens with Rodgers? Wearing a Rodgers jersey yesterday at the Reds game. Got a lot of go Packers. A few yeah. people saying he's going to play. The Brewers game. You were th- yeah. It was at the Brewers Reds game. Brewers lost. Did you say hi to, uh, Lorenzo for me? No, he's on the IL. Oh, is he? Um, yeah, sadly. Didn't play. But. I don't think he's playing for the Packers anymore. Really? The, yeah. He, the further we get into June, though? He doesn't talk to his own family. This is the thing I keep going back to. Um, yeah, I agree. He's one of the most stubborn, self 
driven individuals in you know NFL history. If he has made up his mind on something, which I don't think he's posturing at this point because the contract situation, it's not a contract situation that's like untenable. If that's what it was, if he's made up his mind on something, he's made up his mind on something. It's not gonna you're not gonna change his mind is what I'm, is my, is what I'm of the opinion. So I, I just think that the Packers would be smart to recognize that and sell high. You're not going to get, he plays, even if he plays at an MVP level again this year. And I, again, like I said, I don't think he's going to play for the Packers. Even if he does, you're, you're never going to get more from him in a trade that you get right now. You get a lot for him. Sam, I completely disagreed with Sam's take on <laughs> The worst he said that the worst case scenario for the Packers was trading him and then having him go win a Super Bowl elsewhere. When I was like, well, the the worst case scenario is retirement. Yeah, that's the worst case because you get nothing in return, and that's very likely if they if they try to call his bluff. In my opinion. Oh man, so you really don't even think you don't even think they just reconcile for like a year because so isn't his his rift is more. With the structure of the organization and the whole deal, right? But not Lafleur, right? It, or not Lafleur. And it's been positioned because because people have tried to talk about their little feud for the last two years and this and that. But clearly, they were best friends last year. You know, we're using motion more. We're doing this. We're throwing forty four touchdowns and four picks. Yeah. No, it's not Lafleur. It's not players on the roster. I don't even think it's the drafting of wide receivers. It's just the treating players like it's a business instead of their family sort of thing like not yeah not giving that respect to the guys who have rightfully earned it and i i don't blame him whatsoever if that's his take on it i mean so is that a structural issue in green bay that there 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 are figureheads but there's not the figurehead right you don't you're not going to shad khan or you're not going to that's Robert why i think it's not, that's why i think it's not going to be solved because there's no there's no guy to fire it's they all make i'd get rid of together. yankee <laughs> get rid of nathan get him out of there uh it, it's I mean, you have Mark Murphy as the president, but he answers to the board who he's the president, but they make decisions together with Gutekunst, who's more uh, the evaluator. And it's this whole thing that I think he's upset at everyone there, not just, hey, you fired Gutekunst and we're good. It's just the way they've gone about their business. So this is what I do here. I don't stay on, on schedule. That reminded me of something. Okay. Gut said something in his press conference. I don't know. Did you hear his press conference at all after the draft? Yeah, I did. talking about Amari Rodgers wearing like the funeral suit, yeah. <laughs> all black. George couldn't get over it. George mentioned yeah. it fifteen times. On if you had the over on how many times George was going to mention his suit on the draft show, yeah. you won. Um, but he mentioned for Amari Rogers, you know how we sit here and we're like, oh, you have the trade chart and you got to do this and here's the strategy. He said, just go get him. And he was telling the story about uh, when they um, Ted Thompson went to get Clay Matthews, mm -hmm. you know, over ten years ago. And, you know, he just said, go get Clay Matthews. And everybody's like, oh, what do you want to give up? He said, just get the player. I don't care. Player, yeah. He didn't even care. That's what the Packers did with Amari Rodgers. Is that, what are your thoughts on that strategy? Go get this one player. I don't care what it takes. I mean, so that's been his MO, which was not Ted Thompson's MO. I'm a team Ted Thompson all the way. That was a rare he move for the, Ted to say that yeah, about Clay. The biggest thing that Ted Thompson, his biggest downfall was not recognizing that salary cap was going to skyrocket. I thought the way he went about with trading down, not ever pigeonholing himself into one player, trying to make sound business decisions when at all times was the correct way to sort of build around Aaron Rodgers. Just give yourself this big window, and at some point you'll hit. The biggest thing he screwed up was was not sign up, sort of plugging that roster's holes, realizing that the cap hit was not going to be uh, unmanageable and, right. and unworkable in the future years. Like you didn't have to keep all this space just in case, you know, X, Y, Z happened. The cap was going to double or the cap was going to keep going up. It started right. at 125 million in 2010. And then it got up to, or even less than that, maybe like 110 million. And it got up to 200 million over the course of a decade. And just not seeing that that was going to happen, I think was their biggest downfall. Losing yeah. players like Casey Hayward, Micah Hyde, that did not sign big deals yeah. elsewhere. That they just could have easily fit under with a little bit of cap magic. And not even a little bit of cap magic, just could have fit under, but just didn't have that foresight. Yeah, I, I, I pick my spots, but I like to listen to some of those press conferences because you get nuggets like that mm -hmm. where you just get into the brains of the evaluators. Uh, I thought Chris Ballard had a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, and then every team found football players. Every team. It, it's not even an advantage because there was, what, how many, 257 or whatever players drafted yeah. that just love football. So it's not even an advantage anymore because every team got guys who love football. football. Players, yeah, guys who fit their culture.
So speaking of guys who love who who loves football in the 2022 draft, high level, you're early in the evaluation process here, right? We're gonna have a preseason draft guide again. Yes. What are the strengths and weaknesses of this draft? It's gonna be and much needed if you look at the NFL landscape today. Probably the best cornerback class that we've seen since we started doing this here at PFF. Best one, really? Yeah. If they all declare. Now it's a very good cornerback class. You have obviously Derek Stingley Jr. People have been talking about him since freshman year, highest grade. PFF grade as true freshman, you know, Derwin James-esque when he came out. Love Derwin it. was the highest grade as a freshman. Um, he's going to be a dude. Uh, you got Kyer Elam from Florida, who is exceptional uh, as well, just kind of an all-around corner. Ahmad Gardner, Sauce Gardner, hometown guy. Yeah. Uh, actually, even from Cincinnati. Heard, he's he's going to be on the show, right? Austin's, yeah. Austin's working. We're going to get, get him on, on the show. But he's been another guy as true freshman, 90-plus coverage grade, uh, long, athletic dude. You have Martin Emerson from Mississippi State. You have uh, Andrew Booth from Clemson. Uh, you have Darren Kendrick, who's transferred to Georgia. You've got a lot of guys who could be in that first-round mix at the cornerback position. So probably one of the strong cornerback classes. Like the, how I felt about last year's wide receiver class heading into the season, that's how I would say about this cornerback class. Which like this, is, this could be very, very good. Is it going to be another – we've had back-to-back -back really good receiver classes. Now we're just a few years removed from the year Calvin Ridley came out and Michael Gallup. I remember we – uh, DJ Moore, but we were putting the rankings together and we were like, everybody feels like the third or fourth best receiver in the class. Nobody felt like a one, even though those guys all ended up being productive. Yeah. Um, do you think it's the nature of the receiver position though? Where So from an, from an evaluation perspective, it's easier to look at a receiver and say, he can do this, this, and this. And if that's what you ask him to do, he's productive and he's a two or he's a three. And that's valuable versus corner. Where you, it's not even about what they can do. It's like, well, you can't really have weaknesses because in the NFL, you truly have to. You have to go, you got to play zone. You got to play man. You got to play press. Yeah. You got to play off. Do you think we're too favorable in wide receiver evaluations because the nature of the position lends it to oh, what yeah, he can do? I agree. Yeah, I think we are. Where it's like, oh, we in general he fits not perfectly PFF, into X Y Z scheme. Uh, Yo, know, if you have a slot role, they just throw him screens every time. Oh, he's gonna be great. It's like. Yeah that's probably there's zero chance it's going to actually be his role in the NFL so yeah I, I do think you can overrate saying this guy does one thing well just have him do that one thing mm, it's not how necessarily an NFL offense works so I, I do agree with that assessment the uh the DK Metcalf example though is a is a good one right because you said if he's a vertical receiver and uses his speed and uses his body on slants or whatever it's like he could be really productive and I know he does a few more of those things in Seattle but it's pretty much that right it's like yeah. go balls and back shoulders and slants and and you got the best deep ball thrower and it, and it works out you can't actually do that at the nfl level so corner but that's but that, that's where and as i said the why we focus on winning down the football field because that's where you can if, if you want a guy to just run goes and posts and whatever that's a role that exists in a lot of offenses right just the guy who goes deep that that is a role but the guy who's underneath that is not a role so cornerbacks really deep the nfl absolutely does need that because mm -hmm. i think if you were just ranking the top 10 to 15 corners in the NFL, I don't think there's a clear consensus. I, it, there's, they, they need help in the, <laughs> covering these incredible offenses. How about your boy Kyle Hamilton at, uh, at Notre Dame? Love Kyle Hamilton. I, I, I say there, there's a few. There's a few. So last year, I thought there was one blue chip defensive player, Micah Parsons. After that, I didn't think there was any guy where it's like he's going to be a stud in the NFL. Like if he doesn't become a stud, it's because of injuries or off field or whatever. Uh, I think in this upcoming class, there's a few. I would throw Stingley, obviously, in there. Kyle Hamilton, I would throw in there as well. Notre Dame safety. He's 6'4", 220. He's huge. Yeah, he's a unique safety. And so he's Isaiah Simmons-esque, but I think he actually stays at safety. Really? Or if not, like plays a Derwin James role. He's not going to be a linebacker. He is a safety. He is that good in space. I brought this up on the two-point drafts. Go listen. But the he broke up a dig route against 2-2 Atwell. One-on-one. A dig route against Tutu Atwell. Two, two rounds of four, three, whatever. Like, like one of the fastest wide receivers in college football. Second round pick. This is a safety who is 6'4", 220, and he is stride for stride with him on a dig As route. a true that freshman, right? This was no, this, this is past year. This is past year, okay. That shouldn't be possible. You know, that, like that, like if you were a 5'10", 190 safety, that you shouldn't stick with Tutu Atwell. But he did. He's a, he's a monster. His first pass breakup was as a true freshman against Louisville, and mm -hmm. I, his, his eyes – were incredible on the play. I mean, that's that's one thing from a safety position. Watching 
here's what his read's supposed to be. Here's where he's supposed. To, here, where, here's where he's supposed to get to. He does that, and then he does something else, which was break on an underneath route. I mean, he, some of the plays he's made in coverage are absolutely incredible yeah. at his size. So the secondary is going to get some help, maybe yes. in the uh, in the NFL. Yeah, Jordan Battle from Alabama is a really good safety too. Uh, it's it, top of the cornerback class, top of the safety class, and top of the edge class. I like better than this past year probably. Okay, because yeah, definitely defensively. I mean, there wasn't a defensive player. When was the first defensive player off the board this year? Eight. Eight. Jason so, that's right. So I keep – I always – by the way, I don't know if this happens to you. I get more confused by my old mock drafts. Sometimes yeah. I put a, mo- a guy in a mock in the second yep. round. I'm like, oh, he was a second rounder to that team, and it wasn't reality. So my mind is is clouded. But we were talking about a defensive player maybe not being off the board until 10 or 11. He comes off at 8. Mm-hmm. This should be different next year with some of these blue chippers that you're talking yeah. about. Jalen um, Thibodeau from Oregon. Yeah. DeMarvin Leal from Texas A&M, two defensive linemen that they'll go top ten. Are you higher on Leal than everybody else at the moment? I don't know where everyone else – There's. it's still too early to say where yeah. everyone else is at on people, but that guy is it's awesome. Thibodeau's the one who has all the – Thibodeau's the hype. one who has all the hype, and rightfully so. I mean, he has the – kind of that all-around ideal edge traits of size, 6'5", 250 plus – probably 34 something inch arms gets off the ball like he's a wide receiver uh, he has that skill set that just wins consistently and he already uses his length really well leo is the one who so he's 290 plus pounds 64 290 and he plays edge he's not gonna play edge in the nfl no yeah. no one's 290 still playing edge in the nfl that's a rarity so cameron jordan he's gonna maybe. be on the interior but he wins yeah he, he wins on the edge like his first step off the edge is absurd that guy can get off the ball so I'm excited to see when he does, if he plays a little more on the interior, what he looks like, because he could be special. What about offensively? Uh, this quarterback class got hyped up a little bit. We we always knew Trevor Lawrence was there. Coming into the year, we knew Tr- Justin Fields was there. Mm-hmm. It was those two, and all of a sudden, Zach Wilson shows up, and Mac Jones shows up, and we knew Trey Lance was in there, right? Yeah. Quarterback class. There's no consensus number one yet. But in recent years, we've seen Joe Burrow. We've seen mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Kyler Murray. Or is there a consensus number one? I think Spencer Texas? Rattler. I'd be hard-pressed to find a board or someone who doesn't have the opinion that Rattler's number one right now. But I, I think he's the only one. So on the PFF board, if we think of guys a franchise-type quarterback that's going to, you know, has, can be a top 10, 12 quarterback in the NFL, whatever, you, you line them up at the top of the draft because that's how you should draft. <laughs> if, right. you, if a guy's that good at the quarterback position, you should draft them. Unless you got Patrick Mahomes. Um, and then, in which case, you're not going to be able to draft that guy. But that's how we line up our draft board. When the draft board comes out, it's only going to be Spencer Rattler at the top and no one else at two. I don't think there's anyone else right now that I would say is that sort of guy. And the names, Sam Howell, Keaton Slovis, Sam Howell of North Carolina, Keaton Slovis of USC, uh, you know, JT Daniels, Georgia, Malik Willis, Liberty. There, there are names out there that are talented dudes. I just would not put any of them in that air yet. Malik Willis is getting all the hype because that highlight reel is ridiculous yeah, I say that, that he's the fun to watch he's the hashtag fun to watch guy i don't i watched uh only his big time throws first mm-hmm. 20 of them last year 19 or 20 of them and i was i was sold i think what do you think if I, i've got opinions on his arm what do you where do you think his arm stands it's i think it's the strongest of any of these guys bar none he had a i think it's allen territory yeah i, I do too it's in it's, josh it's allen a, land it's a monster and he has you know like a like a 30, 30 yard throws that just don't leave, don't go higher than his helmet. Yeah. Because you know, like, he has a little three quarters release and it just zips. He has really a cannon for an arm. What do you make of Slovis or Sam Howell and, and these guys that have, um, they've been pretty productive tools wise? Are they? I think Howell is. I think Howell has a very strong arm also. He's more, size is going to be the thing with him. He, he he, Baker Mayfield esque size, like he's just a shade. He might be six foot, yeah, like two twenty. Uh, not, not your athletic, but like like Baker Mayfield, he's like athletic enough to make a little bit, but not gonna rely on it. And, and I just that offense is so just absurdly simplistic. It's Baylor plus, right? I yeah. mean, it's that it's that. And, and when yeah, we describe it, no one, Baylor, no one goes full Baylor anymore. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> Which, the. The Baylor offense offense was, again, we always describe this. This is one of the most difficult ones to evaluate quarterbacks because there were literally no reads. It was 
spread it out as far as you can across the field, find one-on-one, -on -one, chuck it deep. <laughs> I was going to say, is it, it was counting numbers is what it was. It was how many numbers are on that side, how, how many defenders are on that side. Pick, pick the one with fewer. <laughs> yeah, my four- and five-year-old are pretty good at counting right yeah. now. They, they got that. Yeah. So. so that's why Bryce Petty looks like he did there and then like he did at the Jets. Yeah, the, the Baylor tree is obnoxious to me from a player evaluation standpoint. They're tough. Yeah. Um, Emery Jones, Florida. Emery Jones is my dark horse breakout guy. That's your guy? He, he's very talented. Like physically, what he can do as a runner – what he has from an arm strength perspective. I, I was encouraged by how he looked against Oklahoma coming in for Trask, obviously, after the wheels came off with Trask in that game. Not not putting him in any sort of first, second, third round conversation yet, but I do think the tools, and obviously he's in an offense with Dan Mullen that's probably going to they're going to set use, him up to look good. They've they've used him as a change of pace a lot the last couple yeah. of years as far as running the ball. He's the runner. He'll, he'll add. It'll look more like Dak's offense rather. You know, um, under Mullen, yeah. where Dak – that was that was a tough part about Dak, too. They used him on QB power and counter so much, and he actually was really comfortable just dropping back and chucking it. Um, it was someone else – oh, um, Matt Corral at Ole Miss. That's another kind of like a Baylor – it's Lane Kiffin, but mm -hmm. stealing some of the Baylor-esque concepts. I do uh, Mississippi radio every week, and they're just – they're ready. All in on Corral. They're ready. They're all in on Corral in the first round. And I was like, Dude, guys, he's listed at 6-1. You know he's probably five eleven and a half, and that's gonna that's gonna ding him in the NFL. Do you have any thoughts on? Corral See, I'm at this biased point? against Matt Corral because I love John Reese Plumley. Oh, okay. He was yeah. that guy was electric. That was the best runner at the quarterback position in college football. Yeah, he was, and just got benched. Because Keepers for like throw seventy for sure. yards left and right because <laughs> they wanted to throw the ball, whatever. But Corral's no, a baller. Corral's, Corral's he's good. I, I wouldn't put him close to the air of like even a first rounder at this point. He's very consistent. But describe – um, I want to talk Rattler really quick. So okay. he's, the, he's the clear top guy for you. Yeah. What's his skill set like? What are we thinking? When he was recruited, people were like, oh, this is just a hybrid between Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield. Nice job over there at Oklahoma. So, I mean, stylistically, like the way he throws the ball looks a lot like Kyle, Kyler Murray, like the just yeah. arm, how it whips. Uh, he's – I think was Seth Galina described him as the Gen Z um, quarterback – whatever that like the, if that elicits thoughts in your mind it did in mine and it's perfect because he's he kind of takes the the sort of what everyone's looking for of the outside the pocket you know out of structure plays he takes that to the extreme it's yeah. all outside of structure with that. yeah and, and now he's got ridiculous arm talent very athletic add on the run game but it is not he is not really playing a lot within the oklahoma offense it's a lot of and they're even like scheming it up uh, Lincoln Riley is in that offense to kind of give him almost like late reads where it's like this is a play that's designed to it goes here but then uh, four seconds late four seconds after the snap it'll go here because like your route will break off to this intentionally because we know Spencer Riley can do this because we know we have an offensive line that could probably do this fascinating yeah. I it, I was at, I was listening to Seth and um, their podcast I think last week they had coach Voss on yeah. talking the defense crew just the the nitty-gritty X's and O's and all that stuff. Really great stuff. So go check that out. Um, but even just listening to that about how, like, in 7-on-7, um, in seven seven, they were saying how when you coach 7-on-7 seven seven in high school, there you have, like, essentially four seconds yeah. to run a play. So you, you just your coverages are different. It's mm -hmm. not like cover this zone. When you're teaching defense, it's like cover this zone, but also this one after three seconds and all this stuff. Switch, yeah. It's almost like the offensive version of that. But it also feels like this adjustment to all the three-man rushes you see in college football mm -hmm. um, just to compare to Brady again like when you rush three against say Brady in the red zone it's happened his whole career he just he's patient like good quarterbacks are just patient they're like oh I know three men are rushing I know there's going to be a lane to step into somewhere whereas other quarterbacks they're Don't just so it. structurally mm -hmm. trained they just say I'm just going to go through my reads but against the it, yeah yeah and within the fl function of timing yeah like I, I, I remember Stafford actually doing that a ton three-man rush and he's just like I'm going one to two to three and throwing it instead of actually saying let me find the pass rush lane it sounds like that's Rattler right I mean you've got these three-man rushes and it's like I don't need to throw the ball yeah. on time right I'm it's gonna like, watch me do this. I'm gonna wait I'm gonna make you cover four and five seconds and uh, and break it down yeah. um, if there's a thread between Mahomes and Josh Allen as like the breakout players when you were describing those guys coming out of college, it was they are so comfortable outside the pocket. 
they're not as comfortable inside the pocket. Mahomes, because he would do this, just yeah. leave the pocket, whereas Allen just wasn't really accurate or you know timing-wise. Yeah. But they had instincts. They had passing feel. They had playmaking ability. Is that the X factor? I So I love – I've I've said this a few times. The And this is not mine. This was Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks on their podcast. They talk about a shooter versus a scorer at the quarterback position. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, they can score. They can nothing has to go right with anyone else, and they can put points on the board. Uh, a shooter has to get almost schemed open, or like has to has to get the ball with the lane. Has to have a guy open. Has to see a guy open. Uh, and so the guys that can score are the guys that are winning more in the NFL, winning more in the NBA. You want the scores, not to say you can't fill up a box score as a shooter. Like you can. You know, what's his face? Who's the Clay Thompson can put up 60 in a game, but it has to be because other guys are doing it around him too. You can't just drop a shooter in and ask him to continually win you games. I like that analogy. I do too. That's why I use it a lot. That's a good, no, that's a good Still, analogy. Yeah. I mean, because I usually just speak in tiers, QB tiers, and I think ultimately you do get that, those types of guys. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing to me is if you, if you watch Peyton Brady breeze throughout their career, even though it doesn't look like Mahomes, they do actually have elements of that where it's like, hey, everything's covered. I'm still going to put it where it needs to go exactly. or I'll buy it's, time. It's it, so not it's, just, not, it's not highlight real plays. Yeah, it's not always just that. A lot of it can be just throwing a guy open, like a back shoulder to a guy who's covered. Right. That was Aaron Rodgers over the course of his career. Like having a guy who it's nothing's there, but you create it because of how you play the quarterback position. All right, what else do we need to know about this 2022 draft class? Receivers, uh, low receivers line. It, it's a lull at receivers. It is not the all world class that we've seen before. Uh, one and two on the board of the Ohio State guys, Garrett Wilson, and Chris Olave. They're very good. After those two, I would put those two in the first round mix. There's not another guy where I'm like, first rounder. I haven't watched the tape. So, so it has that, been sick prior. Well, there was probably like five or five or so guys that you watch at this point. You're like, that guy's probably going to be a first rounder. So it is cyclical. Yeah. The, the receiver thing. So people it's, like to speak trends. Oh, there's going to be five receivers in the first round every year. Yeah. yeah I, I don't think that's going to be the case this upcoming season. Now, it, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, – but I, I, I do think there is an influx of wide receiver talent. Like it's, it, it is somewhat of a trend, but it's not, oh, every class is – can't miss guys now. So. I think the hardest position to predict how strong it's going to be is O-line because there are so many guys. It, it is the position where you see consistent development. Guys get stronger in the whole thing, so they'll be quote-unquote breakout players. Yeah. But is there is there an early view across the line if it's strong or uh, lower on first-round talent? I, I think it's definitely lower than this past. This past was ridiculously deep. It doesn't have the top end that we had two years ago either. That one's – I don't see a lot of classes matching that where he had Worfs, Becht, and Wills, um, Thomas. But I do think there's a number of guys that I would put in first round conversation right now. Uh, Evan Neal from Alabama at tackle, was the right tackle this past year. Tyler Lindebaum from Iowa, is the center. Now he's put a lot of interior office linemen in the first round, but he. He was in our preseason top 50 last year. Yeah. And beat, then back to school. Beat Tris, Tristan Worst wrestling in high school. Really? He beat Tristan Worst wrestling. I, I don't think he lost maybe like one other time. Oh, give me that guy. Yeah. You want that guy. Yeah. I want <laughs> that guy on my team. Absolutely. Yeah. And he started defensive line at Iowa as a freshman and then switched over to center. And he's been their center the last two years. So, I like that. Right. Did, um, what about Andrew Thomas this year? I know you had some thought on, I'm just, oh. I'm bouncing all over the place. Giants offensive tackle struggled early on. He was our top tackle coming out and he, he was, he yeah, was see, not great was, as a rookie. Every single person on that Giants line. I want to know who their offensive line coach was. I mean, they fired him mid season, right? They, they, wasn't that right? Because even, Guys like well, who's the left guard there that we like coming out? Hernandez. Will Hernandez. Will yeah. Hernandez. Career worst pass blocking grade. Yeah. Career worst. Like this is that was year three. Right. And he has the worst. And that's, that's when you're that's supposed you to be getting better. You know? Yeah. Uh, no one was pass block. Like they they just whatever they were coaching, whatever they were telling these guys to do was not working for anybody. So I'm making excuses for myself right here. Yeah. But no. But it, but it's I mean Kevin Zeitler. 59.2 pass blocking grade last year. Kevin he Zeitler, had his one of the season, best yeah. pass protectors of the past decade. Like they were across the board underperforming. And when that's the case, it's like, that seems a little bit of a, 
I'm, I'm, I, I do think he makes a pretty significant leap in year two. I'm trying to defend my number 32 ranking of the Giants offensive line. And, and I did it on the last podcast. I was just trying to explain. I, I can see them all getting better. I just don't have evidence right now. Yeah. I can see Thomas getting better. I can see it's either Matt Parrott or Nate Solder at right tackle. And, you know, whoever wins that job will probably be solid. If Parrott wins it, good for him. You know, he's a good developmental prospect. Um, they put Nick Gates at center after not even snapping the ball in his college or NFL career. I mean, so there's, there are areas to get better. But, yeah, Andrew Thomas was that uh, that big question mark there. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. That was great. Anything else you want to discuss while you're on the on the big show here? Any other good theories or uh, Ooh, theories? Any theories or scouting terms? Bring it all. What, what oh, you got here? We are on the spot. We're gonna try to create some new scouting terms. This is gonna be the goal for next next. I sent you one cycle. last night. Are yeah, you gonna send implement me a great that? One. It's a Tinder linebacker who's got he's good with his hand swiping left and right. I was listening to the show and you said this guy. You said he doesn't necessarily want to take on blocks. He's just a swipe left, swipe right guy. So I was like, that's Tinder a Tinder backer. backer. Tinder backer. That Tinder backer. That one's going to get utilized. That's going to be put into put into a lot of different. Tinder edge is a sw- guy who just swipes well. <laughs> swipe in any oh, position. Tind- if you're swiping well, you're, you're Tinder. Are you going to add Tinder to everything then, huh? Well, I'm go- excited to do – we're going to do the uh, – we're going to do the trait grades this summer. Oh, that's we're going to go – are do. we going to go through that? Yeah, I am. Excellent. That's what Good. I'm excited to do. Do you think it's worth backfilling – going backwards and trying to do it or are we going to be too biased that's what i think i think you risk putting bad data if you back yeah so just to front fill. just to explain that so our goal here at pf we want to be really good at evaluating players we want to be as good as possible and i do think what you talked about at the beginning of the show was the ability to go back and say hey we just focused on production early on we've learned a few things and um and eric has done a really good job in his projection system and it's like okay what data are we going to ingest before we spit out how we're going to project guys going forward? Production is still the biggest one, uh, higher at some positions than others. Athleticism, depending on the position, certainly matters, right? If you're mm-hmm. evaluating an edge, get a productive guy who's athletic, you're probably going to hit 80, That's 90% good, of yeah. the time. You're going to be fine. Other positions, it's not as cut and dry. But the one thing that we might be missing is just truly quantifying traits, not just saying this guy's a knee bender. This guy's, uh, you know, got explosive, but actually putting hard numbers Number. to that. And this could help, I think, bridge the gap as far as production, yeah. athleticism, and then just describing on-field play, yeah. right? Like, it's still it's still subjective nature of, hey, how explosive is this guy? But if you put, you put it, you can put it as a more accurate data point than just saying he's explosive, how explosive? Do you think yeah. he's a nine explosive or do you think he's a six explosive? Because those are both explosive. Those probably both get explosive on a scouting report, but they're, one might lead to more success, the guys who are really at the high end versus the maybe mid-tier guys. I like it. I'll play this game with you. I'll add. We'll do it. We're just trying to add more data to the mix Yep. to uh, improve our projections going forward. So check out Mike and Austin Gale. It's the two-for-one drafts podcast, soon to be something else. Complete rebrand coming up soon. We're going to call it uh, evolution. Business Mike and Evolution. <laughs> Um, the entire – check out me on the Chris Collinsworth podcast hey, this yeah, week. So Chris usually has this nice, tight, one-hour podcast. I think we went for over two hours Oof. this week. It's not easy, old men like Chris and I going for two hours, but uh, we broke down every single team. Did you have some performance-enhancing drugs? Well, Chris – it was Chris's fault. Okay. He comes in, he's like, oh, let's, let's just go team by team. I'm like, do you know what you're getting <laughs> yeah, into? 32 teams. We were 10 teams in an hour into the pod, and I'm just like, we're going to finish this thing, huh? Um, that's how Sam and I end up going for two hours all the yeah. time. Oh, yeah. Because it's like, oh, we, everybody's going to get some love. Yeah. We actually forgot the Texans. And by the end, Chris is like, ah, forget it. Texans. Who Texans cares? fans wouldn't want to hear it anyway. They don't need to. They're off. Yeah. They're taking the year off. We'll talk to you in 2022 to preview. But yeah. go check me out on the Chris Collinsworth podcast and uh, the fantasy podcast. Ian Hartit's doing a great job over there. Subscribe to that one because it's everything you need for uh, for fantasy season. And then the PFF 2021 Best Ball Draft Kit is out. PFF.com. So go check that out as well. All right, Mike. We might not have you on the show for a while. So yeah. any, we've got millions of listeners. What else? Parting shots? Yeah. Uh, go listen to 2 for 1 drafts. It's great. Yeah, go, go listen to 2 for 1. We're trying to prop those guys up. Give them a... Uh, need it. Need just more. It, yeah. it is... Um, how has the podcast evolved even before the the rebrand um we've been we've 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 ventured from not as much hardcore player analysis 
to more uh, talk about just scouting in general and the entertaining aspects of the draft that are that I enjoy because you, there's only so much you can like dive into these guys before you get these eyes. I would say around. yeah, the the high level topics are probably more interesting than like linebacker fifteen, yeah. most likely. So I still like linebacker fifteen though. No, it's it's the fun part here because sometimes yeah. that guy ends up being good. It's uh, it, it it's fun. So anyway, go check them out. Thanks to Mike for joining us. Sam will be Thank back you. next week. We'll be back here on Monday with more NFL discussion. Don't forget to email me NFL Podcast at pff .com. You might be on the show. You'll be our listener of the week. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next week. You're supposed to wave. You wave to everybody.